I walked in thinking that to be an original person in the world, a nonconformist who drives creativity and change, that you had to be four things. I thought you had to be a risk taker, you had to be full of confidence, you had to have great ideas, and you had to be the first mover. And I discovered that all those things were wrong. Not only wrong, but backward. It turns out that most of the original people in the world, whether you're looking at Nobel Prize winning scientists, successful entrepreneurs, creative musicians and artists have these opposite traits in common where they're pretty risk averse. They're not daredevils. They're cautious. They feel the same doubt and fear that the rest of us do. They just harness it as, as motivation as opposed to being paralyzed by it. They have bad ideas. In fact, they have more bad ideas than the rest of us. And that's how they, they get to some true originality is they generate enough volume to get variety and stumble on something new. And they're not first movers, they're procrastinators. They start things early, but they are deliberately slow to finish because they know that good ideas often take time to develop. I'm Srini Rao, and this is the Unmistakable Creative Podcast, where you get a window into the stories and insights of the most innovative and creative minds who've started movements, built thriving businesses, written best selling books, and created insanely interesting art. For more, check out our 500 episode archive at unmistakablecreative.com. Adam, welcome to the Unmistakable Creative. Thanks so much for taking the time to join us. Thank you. I'm thrilled to be here. Yeah, it is really, really cool to have you here. You know, uh, I have been a big fan of your work for for quite some time. And, you know, I, I, right after I read Give and Take, I started following your work really closely. And then when I saw that you had a new book called uh, Originals, How Nonconformists Move the World, I was like, you have to come and talk to our audience. They're the types of people who will eat this up. So on that note, can you tell us uh, a bit about yourself, your story, your background, your journey, and how that has led you to everything that you're up to now and uh, everything with this new book? Oh, well, first of all, thank you, Srinivas. It's so great to be here. I've, I've enjoyed listening to some of your other guests, and uh, you keep inviting really great friends. So I've, I've heard rave reviews consistently. Um, gosh, how does my life story all weave together? It probably doesn't, but I'm going to try to make it seem sort of <laughs> coherent. How's that? Yeah, that works. Uh, all right, so the, the things that jump out at me, uh, I was uh, growing up, I remember a few things standing out. One was my mother telling me that no matter what grade I got in school, as long as I worked my hardest, uh, she would be proud of me. And then she would always add, but if you didn't get an A, I'll know you didn't try your hardest. (laughs) And so, you know, that was a blessing and a curse of sorts. But uh, I was, you know, I was one of these kids who always followed the rules and, you know, I wanted to, like, please my elders and respect authority figures. And I remember getting called to the principal's office uh, once and finding out that I was not in trouble, but I still cried <laughs> <laughs> because I was so, so worried about doing something wrong. And, you know, I think that I guess the, the past decade or so has been a journey for me to become more comfortable um, you know, sharing new ideas, even if other people might not agree with them, and you know, becoming more of a nonconformist. And you know, as as a psychologist, uh, it's hard not to occasionally end up doing a little bit of me search instead of research. <laughs> and so, you know, it's it's one of the topics I've been really curious about. But you know, I, I guess I've, I've always had sort of unconventional interests um, at various points, and uh, I'm interested in how we can help more people embrace those. Cool. Um, well, that raises numerous questions, as you might imagine. Uh, so, you know, one of the things you, you've probably heard me ask a ton of people is about their early childhood. And, uh, you know, you mentioned your mother, but I'm curious what other things are when you look back at the earliest memories of your life. Are there particular moments, people or experiences that you think shaped, uh, you know, who you've ended up becoming today and the work that you do? Yeah, I, I, I mean, my, my dad would, would always teach me these things that I thought were just like, ordinary phrases and then later I found out that he and my mom were both psychology majors in college. No one ever told me. And it was only after I became an organizational psychologist that I discovered this. But, you know, like I grew up like learning all the time about self-fulfilling prophecies. And, you know, like I guess it was like a curiosity about human nature and everyday behavior was sort of in the water growing up. Uh-huh. Um, the other thing that, you know, that I guess jumps out at me right away is uh, my grandmother – uh, was just one of the most generous people you could ever meet. And she lived a f- just a few miles away, and uh, she was really worried, you know, when, when we were young that my mom wouldn't get any time for herself. 
And she once drove two and a half hours in a snowstorm. It was supposed to be a 15 minute drive so that my mom could go exercise for an hour. <laughs> it's like, you sit there thinking, wow, that's, that's just an amazing amount of love and dedication to other people. And I would, I would really like to be more like that. Um, so, you know, those, those are a few things that jump out at me. And then when I was in high school, uh, I got into springboard diving because uh, my mom had dragged me to a local pool and she was worried that I was playing too many video games and I needed some sun and exercise. And I saw this lifeguard on, on break doing tricks and it turned out he was like a, you know, a state finalist diver and I was just mesmerized. I wanted to learn how to do it. Never mind that I was afraid of heights. <laughs> but, uh, I, had, I had an incredible coach, Eric Best, who saw way more potential in me than I saw in myself. And uh, that, I think, was the first moment that I really thought about doing something that I was afraid of. Those moments uh, of being mesmerized, I mean, you, from the perspective of an educator, why do you think that so many people miss those moments in their lives? Like, why do we overlook moments like that? Um, and do you, do you recognize that that was a moment like that only now in retrospect, or did you know what you were getting at the time? I don't know. I think, you know, at, at the time, I was just, I was stunned that I... I, I showed up basically having spent a summer you know, like taking a couple of diving classes and uh, like trying to walk on to the, the team as a freshman in high school. And I saw what some of the other uh, like kids could do, and I, I knew I was not qualified. And Eric sat me down and said, he said, you know, do you want the good news or the bad news? And I was like, start with the bad news for sure. And he said, well, you know, I... I Diving requires explosive power and grace and flexibility, and my grandmother can jump higher than you, and uh, you can't touch your toes, and you walk like Frankenstein. And, wait, there's good news? And he said, yeah, diving is a nerd sport. It attracts all the people who are too slow to run and too weak to play football and too short for basketball. And if you work really hard at this, you can become by your senior year, one of the best in this state. And you know, the, the first part was a joke, but I think that, you know, that that's something that so many teachers and mentors miss because you, it's so, it's so difficult to, to do what Michelangelo had a gift for. Right, which is to like to look at a block of stone and imagine seeing the David in it, and that's what we all have to do when we work with other people. But it requires quite a leap of imagination. Hmm. <clears throat> so that raises a couple of questions and a comment. It sounds almost identical to the story that I have with a seventh grade band director telling me I would be able to do the same of all things with a tuba, <laughs> which I did. <laughs> it's a good uh, thing I did not have that director because it wouldn't have gone well and we wouldn't be having this conversation. <laughs> yeah, well, you know, it turns out that You had some musical talent, right? Well, I did, but it turns out that to get a job as a professional tuba player, you literally have to wait for somebody to die because there's only one in an orchestra. So I, I, I can't help but wonder if people, you know, instead of looking at job boards every day, look at obituaries if they're professional tuba players. <laughs> oh, jeez, that's so sad. Yeah. Um, so, you know, one of the things I'm curious about is is the diving experience, how that influenced and shaped um, what you've done later in your life. Like, what lessons from that whole experience have you applied to the work that you do today? And, and you know, did you apply going forward in your life? I think the biggest thing I took away from it was was discipline. You know, I, I would go day in and day out to do things that terrified me and also caused a reasonable amount of physical pain. So, you know, like a typical day, a couple years in, you know, as I, I started to get more competitive, was I'd have to, to get up on a three meter springboard, uh, leap, you know, at least uh, 10 feet in the air, ideally higher, otherwise it was guaranteed to be a disaster, uh, do a few somersaults and a twist, and hit the water at 30 miles an hour where it feels a lot like concrete. And, you know, occasionally I would, um, I would come out with, with such a deep bruises that it literally hurt to move for six weeks. And the pain was, was some of the worst pain I've ever felt. And, you know, I would have to do this and then go up and do it again. But worse than that was just the, the terror of getting lost, you know, the, the hurling yourself into the air and having no idea where you are and which direction you're facing and where you're spinning, um, I guess facing those those fears and pushing myself through them, um, you know, I remember getting to college, having done a lot of that, and you know, roommates complaining about, oh, this like this reading is really boring, 
I'm like, this hurts so much less than diving, which is supposed to be fun. And I do it as a sport. Uh, so, you know, I guess that was a, that was a useful skill. Mm. The, the, the other thing I took away from it was uh, Eric would, you know, I, when I was scared to try a new dive, I would stand on the board for sometimes as long as 45 minutes, which is like, you know, a third of practice. And, you know, obviously no one was happy about that. And I, yeah, I eventually got to the point where he would just say, Adam, are you going to do this dive or not? And I would say yes, because I was committed to getting better. And I had, you know, I guess high standards and expectations for myself. And he would say, well, if you're going to do it anyway, why don't you just skip the 45 minutes and get it out of your system? And it was such a, it was one of my, my earlier lessons in, you know, in the power of psychology because he was able to take this thing that I had no desire to do and reframe it as something that I could not wait to do. Um, and that, you know, that left me wondering what else we ought to learn about how we can motivate other people and how we can motivate ourselves. Okay. So that, that raises a question of, um, uh, two, two different things, you know, obviously, uh, I read about your work habits in Cal Newport's book, deep work. Uh, and I'm really curious just about, you know, productivity systems that you put in place to motivate yourself and this ability to be this discipline and produce at the level that you do at the, you know, with the level of output that you do, is that something you think can be learned? Or do you think that is something that is cultivated and developed through experience? Yeah, of course. There's a, there's a great body of research on this uh, that Robert Eisenberger spearheaded more than two decades ago uh, on what's called learned industriousness, which is literally like the acquired capacity for self-discipline and willpower. Um, we know now that you know, a lot of discipline seems to be like a muscle where you work it initially and then it tears, but then it builds itself up. And you know, I think a lot of learning discipline is starting by experiencing flow and getting so fascinated by something that you fall into this, you know, like I'm in the zone moment where you lose track of time, you don't notice your surroundings and pretty soon hours have gone by. And for me, you know, I guess learning, learning discipline was a lot of saying, I need to get good enough that I can get into flow in this task. And when something's hard, usually that disrupts flow if it's too hard. And so, you know, if I push, if I push at this, if I, you know, continue to persist at this task that's really frustrating, um, then, you know, I'll develop enough mastery that I can totally get engrossed in it. And that was always something to look forward to and work for. Mm -hmm. I I also think that, I mean, we, we know so much now about, you know, building grit and developing growth mindsets and, you know, something as simple as, you know, as saying to a child, you know, when, when they give up, when math is hard, you know, that feeling of math being hard is your brain growing, right? That, that kind of reframing is enough to motivate persistence. And what is discipline other than, you know, a bunch of acts of persistence strung together that you feel like you're in charge of? Mm. So from the perspective of an educator, um, what have you noticed as patterns in your own students when you see them hit moments of flow or moments when they have stumbled upon something that they are completely drawn towards and have the potential for mastery in? I don't know. I, this is something I would like to, to know more about, right? Because I think it's, I mean, it's one of the greatest moments that you have as a teacher uh-huh. is when, you know, you open a student's eyes to something that, you know, that all of a sudden this reaction is like, wow, I never knew there was something this fascinating out there and I can't wait to know more about it. Um, I don't, I don't know though. What, I mean, you, you spend a lot of time thinking about this. You have conversations with tons <laughs> of interesting people. What's, what's your take on it? You know, I think that uh, in a lot of ways, having been through our education system, uh, I, I often joke that I'm a failed byproduct of the education system. And I went to a good school. I went to Berkeley. Uh, and yet I felt that I was in the wrong place. Like if, if I look back at it now, I'm like it was a total mismatch of talent and environment. So I think it, it often depends on having the right people to bring it about, the right circumstances. I mean, so much of what I've done at this point, getting to write books and, and do all of this is, is entirely accidental because I couldn't find a job. Uh, so that, that's, you know, so, so I kind of can't help but wonder if without the circumstances being what they were, I would have just settled for average. Like I would have been like, all right, cool. Like I can, I can go through this easy sort of middle of the road life because the circumstances don't suck. I think often, you know, I I talked to Salim Ismail from Singularity University and what he had talked about is a forcing function, something that actually becomes the catalyst for the kinds of changes and the kinds of success that we're talking about. Yeah, I can, I, I can see that making a lot of sense. I also think, you know, Reed Hoffman said something really interesting a couple of weeks ago. He said that 
for him, you know, a lot of, of developing, you know, some degree of, of focus and discipline to continue at things that you're failing at or other people are rejecting was to have confidence in himself as a learner, mm-hmm. which I thought was such an interesting phrase because normally when we think about confidence, it's about knowing that you have a certain skill. And he's talking about confidence in a meta skill. <laughs> like I, I have confidence that I can improve my other skills. Mm-hmm. Um, and I think that's I, I would I would really love to know more about how to help kids and adults develop confidence in themselves as learners. That strikes me as, as something important to understand more. Yeah, I mean, I, you, as you might imagine, I have tons of questions uh, related to education for you. But I, one more before we go there. Um, Dan Coyle told me I had to ask you about your time working as a magician. And I figured anybody who goes from magician to Wharton professor, there's got to be an interesting story there. So <laughs> we have to talk about that. And, and also the other question that comes with is, is what did being a magician tell you about, teach you about the work that you've ended up doing today? Right. So the, the short version of the story is I babysat for some kids when I was 12 down the street who were pretty hyper. And one week they got into magic tricks and they actually sat still. So I went home and and got a magic book and learned some tricks and found that I really enjoyed, you know, both learning the skills and actually delivering the trick and, you know, kind of bringing this element of surprise to the table. And I also discovered that as a pretty shy kid, it helped bring me out of my shell. Um, The magic gave me, you know, something to talk to other people about and a way to connect with, with other people. And so I, I started doing more and more of it. By the time I got to college, uh, it was helping me pay for school. And I did literally the nerdiest thing ever in college. I co-founded a magic club. <laughs> like, magic is nerdy. Magic club takes that to a whole different level, right? And uh, my co-founder, David Kwong, actually uh, went on to become a, a professional magician and uh, is doing some pretty amazing things. And I'm very glad he quit his day job and I did not. <laughs> Uh, but I, you know, what, what I learned from magic really was the importance of the element of surprise uh-huh. that, you know, I could do the same trick and depending on how I set it up, the audience could be, you know, kind of amused or totally flabbergasted. So I, I spent, you know, I guess a lot of my time as, you know, as a professor and a writer trying to figure out how do I create that same element of surprise where we introduce a study or a story and it takes an unexpected twist and you're all the more intrigued because of it. Mm. Well, so speaking of your, your work as a professor, I mean, that's obviously how I think most of us who are listening know about you. Um, I, I'm really curious about one thing. You know, I, I think it's really interesting that you have a book called How Nonconformists Move the World, and yet you work in an educational institution. And I think that's – personally, I find that to be somewhat of an odd paradox, especially because you're sort of at the upper echelon of our education system. So I, I have some questions around, you know, what are your thoughts on education in its current form? You know, a lot of parents who are listening to this use content from our show to homeschool their kids, so I'm curious what you'd say to them. And then when you look at something like what Seth Godin is doing with uh, Alt-MBA, especially given that you're at Wharton, what are your thoughts on that? So like four questions in one, I realize. <laughs> and where do you want to start? Well, let's start with your, your, your views on this sort of nonconformist paradox of work, being somebody who writes a book about nonconformity, who embraces nonconformity, but yet works in an educational system that for the most part is driven by conformity. It's so interesting to me that you see a paradox there at all. Because a part of the reason that I was drawn to university life was knowing that I would have the, the security and protection of tenure mm-hmm. to, you know, to be able to champion ideas that were nonconforming, that went against the grain, um, that you know, many people might find hard to, you know, to believe. And you know, I think that that's, that's our charge right? as, as professors and as researchers, is to try to understand the counterintuitive, the unusual, um, you know, the, <laughs> the counter-normative even. Mm-hmm. And I don't think, well, I guess what I'd say is I think we do a better job accomplishing that in our research mm-hmm. than we do teaching it in the classroom. Um, so, you know, as a, like, as a, a former editor of, of a, a major management journal, uh, one of the, the, literally the first thing that I look at when a paper is submitted is, is it interesting? And interesting is literally defined as, you know, does this challenge conventional wisdom in some way? Mm-hmm. Um, does it either shift our consensus or create new consensus? And you know, there's a real premium pace, p- placed on original thought, and you know, people who don't conform to what existing evidence necessarily suggests or what prevailing theories, you know, suppose. Um, in the classroom, I think that you know we've we've done a really poor job for the most part. That higher education and secondary education too 
um, you know, the, the primary goal is basically to teach students a body of codified knowledge that they, then they can regurgitate. Mm -hmm. And we do a horrible job teaching kids to think for themselves. And then, you know, I worry a lot about elite institutions attracting the most conforming high achievers who become these ambitious robots uh, who, you know, master everything that's already known and do absolutely nothing original. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, this is something that, you know, I've, I've spent a lot of time thinking about. And one of the great things about writing a book uh, is that you have to confront your own hypocrisy. <laughs> uh, so I ended up redesigning a big part of um, my semester long class while I was writing this book because I felt like I was failing so miserably on the originality dimension. So you have students that really uh, are resistant to the idea of nonconformity. I'm curious how you break them of that conditioning, at least from your perspective. Because I feel like that's half the work of an educator. And to me, I think I, 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 I said in my own book that half the, the spiritual journey of, of adulthood is basically unraveling all the layers that we've acquired through adulthood and to get back to a place uh, of what we were like in our childhood. Yeah. I mean, there is a lot of unlearning there. I think I'll tell you where I started, which is I created a new assignment for my class, knowing that you know, if there's anything a conformist high achiever loves, it's a chance to earn an A. And I thought, okay, I'm going to bake nonconformity into the evaluation process and see if, you know, that because they're motivated to, to do well in class, if that's something they will get excited about. So I did it later in the semester because, look, I, I teach a class that's basically evidence-based management. And I do want students to know what the best data have to say about the problems they will face as leaders, managers, employees, and parents too. But I, I felt like once they had internalized some of the core you know, bodies of research in the class, it was time to let them challenge it a little bit. So in November, I gave them an assignment. It was a fall class. I said, what I want you to do is pair up with somebody. It's up to you whether you, want, uh, you get to pick your own partner or you want to be randomly assigned. And as a dyad, your job is to film a five-minute TED Talk about an idea around work or psychology or human behavior that you believe in, that you think is counterintuitive, and that uh, ideally challenges something you've learned in this class. And then they, they had a couple of weeks to work on the project. They filmed their mini TED Talks. And I was blown away by the originality of the ideas that were expressed, but also the creative ways that they found to express them. Mm -hmm. And I realized that actually there was, <laughs> there was a ton of latent originality that I was just thwarting by not giving them the opportunity to express it. Uh, and I think that you know, giving them a, an assignment where they had to do something different and they had to use a medium that's not normally engaged in the classroom mm -hmm. was enough that they were pretty comfortable going out on a limb. Can you share a specific example uh, of one of your students and, and what surprised you uh, the most out of this experience? Oh, yeah. One of, I mean, one of the top talks this year was uh, a talk on why women should be allowed to have um, babies with them in prison. Huh. Uh, so if, you know, if a pregnant woman is incarcerated, they said, what we believe is that every state and every country should have a law that you know, a woman should not be separated from her child. Um, and you know, obviously, there's been some concern about the well-being of the baby, but we should also be concerned about taking babies away from their mothers. And they, they brought a bunch of research to bear on it. They looked at um, you know, some really cool experiments they found about how, you know, how, this, like, how the, uh, be growing up without a parent and especially without a mother affects kids. And uh, they made a really compelling case. And it was well-delivered and funny. Uh, there was one the previous year, the first year that, that I tried this experiment, it was a TED Talk about why we shouldn't give TED Talks. <laughs> that was so clever. And of course, I disagreed with the fundamental premise because right. I love TED Talks, yeah. as we all do. Um, but I thought, you know, I, I respected the courage that it took to do it. Uh -huh. And, you know, they, they actually came up with some interesting arguments about how if you're not careful, you could just end up conforming to what you're <laughs> hearing in TED Talks and you need to give your own, not just listen to other people's. And then they gave their own meta TED Talk. It was all quite delightful. Well, I, I've always jokingly said that the ultimate paradox of nonconformity is is the amount of people conforming to its ideals. Oh my gosh! I mean, I, I actually think at this point, conformity is almost the new originality, right? Because <laughs> of that, like if I hear one more person tell me I'm going to be an entrepreneur and I have an app, uh -huh. I'm like, I think we have a lot of apps already. Tell me what's new about yours. Yeah. Um, 
so this obviously raises more questions uh, about the classroom. I, I'm curious why you think in our education system, the kind of thinking you're talking about is not more prevalent and more universal. And, you know, when I asked Salim Ismail about this and, and the work that they're doing at Singularity, he was saying, you know, it's kind of nuts because by the time most people finish a degree, the degree is outdated. And the challenge they're having at Singularity University, the reason they can't become accredited is because they update their curriculum so frequently, <laughs> which that, that's ridiculous to me. So I, I'm curious, you know, one, you know, from where you're standing and your vantage point, what is the future of this going to look like? And why do you think we're so resistant to ideas uh, like the ones you have? Like, why are they not more prevalent in our education system? Wow. I mean, accreditation, I think, is a mess. Right. At, at Penn, we had to extend the school year because we were in danger of having not enough days to qualify. Wow. <laughs> at, like, as if students are going to learn more by tacking on a few extra days. Right? I would say give them fewer days and challenge them to be creative in the extra time they have free. Um, why, why, is, why is this kind of thinking not more prevalent? I think that there are probably a couple of reasons. One is a system justification problem. Um, so you're familiar with system justification theory. I think it's such a pow powerful theory that people want to live in a just world. And they have a hard time questioning whether the, the systems that they are part of um, are, you know, are right because they've been served well by them in the past in this case. So if you have a bunch of people who have been standout students and who have been successful under that model, how could there be anything wrong with it? Mm -hmm. uh, I think that's one factor at play. I think another thing is, you know, anytime you embrace change, it becomes unpredictable. And, you know, there are a lot of people who worry that we're going to throw out the baby with the bathwater. If we're constantly updating the curriculum, then how are we going to know what, you know, what we're actually teaching and how will students be prepared to learn? I guess where I stand on that is, yes, we should have a codified body of knowledge that students need to learn about a domain. But I'm pretty sure that that does not include, you know, if you're learning math, like, do you have to learn the second derivative in calculus? I don't know. Um, I, I would like to see you know some smaller list of the basics, and then allow accreditation to be determined by you know either you know the the contributions of your students five years out mm -hmm. as you begin to see what they they add to the world, or you know some consensus among you know faculty at a few other schools who themselves are nonconformist that you are not doing a complete disservice to your students. Mm. What do you think the future of this is going to look like? I don't know. I think I mean it's 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 hard for me to imagine that you know a dramatic amount of change is going to happen in the next 5 to 10 years uh -huh. because there are a lot of schools that you know have very little to gain and a lot to lose by making major changes. Right. I will say I'm very excited to see what um Rebecca Cantor ends up doing. She's an entrepreneur in residence at uh, GLG right now and she has some pretty bold ideas for reinventing education. Uh, imagine, for example, if um, Peter Thiel and Harvard had a baby, mm -hmm. uh, what that, that institution would look like. I have a feeling that that's the kind of thing that she would want to create. And I imagine yeah. it's going to be pretty exciting. But I, I guess, you know, as you pointed out, it's really hard for a lot of institutions to gain legitimacy when they're doing things that are radically different. Um, well, here, let me, let me give one practical prediction, which is we have this whole debate about you know, instructor-driven versus you know, sort of student-led learning, uh -huh. right? So should like, I, as a teacher, be delivering information to my students, which is spoon-fed to them, or should they be doing more self-directed learning? And I think that's the wrong question. I think it's a, it's a false dichotomy. I think the most effective model is peer-to-peer -peer learning. Uh, where students have to go and understand an area themselves, and then when they really master it is when they teach it to others. Mm -hmm. We have known for decades that the best way to learn about something is to teach it. And why we don't have more classrooms that are organized in part around peer-to-peer -peer learning is completely beyond me. So I don't know about you, but vacuuming is not one of those things that I ever look forward to doing. But as you know, your environment has a huge impact on your creativity. So I still like it to be clean wherever I'm living and working. But now it doesn't have to be something that you deal with. If you're like me and you grew up in the 80s, you probably fantasized about the day when cleaning your house would be like it was for the Jetsons, meaning you don't have to lift a finger. Well, the good news is that we're already kind of living in that future. And the easiest way to make sure your floors are clean every day is with the iRobot Roomba Robot vacuum. It cleans up after itself. The clean base automatic dirt disposal takes convenience to a new level, automatically empties its own bin into an allergen lock bag that holds 60 days of debris and traps 99% of pollen, 
mold, and dust mites, so you can forget about vacuuming for months at a time. Let the Roomba clean for you instead. It learns your home, finds dirt, and empties itself on its own. It's got powerful cleaning performance made effortless. Remember, if it's not from iRobot, it's not a Roomba. To learn more, go to iRobot.com slash unmistakable. Hmm. So that, I think, makes a perfect setup to ask you one last question, and then we'll get into the book itself. Um, I'm curious what you think about things like Seth Godin's Alt-MBA, which kind of embraces this whole idea of peer-to-peer learning. I, I'm guessing you're somewhat familiar with it. Yeah, Seth is a friend, and you know, he's one of the great originals of our time. So <laughs> I'm, you know, I'm a big fan of the, the four-week format. I think intensive learning is the way to go. Uh, I, you know, I don't think it makes any sense to say, you know, we're going to lecture at you for 12 years and then assume you'll know something about this topic. Mm-hmm. Uh, I think the you know the idea of doing it online is really compelling. I think there are some aspects of learning that are hard to substitute for, uh, you know, kind of the face to face experience. But um, I'm excited to see where it goes. And I think you know we at Wharton we've done um, more and more sort of intensive module based learning. In fact, the the core leadership and teamwork class that I co teach for our MBAs is literally a week long, and it's all the students are doing during that week. Uh, and I think we're going to see more institutions moving in that direction. So I think Seth is on to something pretty exciting. Well, let's do this. Let's shift gears and let's get uh, right into the framework for the book. Because I think you know part of what I appreciate about work that people like you and people like Brené Brown do is that it's all rooted in research as opposed to sort of uh, opinion, which you know a lot of creativity re- uh, you know work tends to be a lot more opinion driven. And especially, wait, hold on. You don't want me to just make stuff up. <laughs> Come on. Well, so much fun. Yeah. If there's anything I learned in the process of writing a book, it was how often I was asked to back up things with examples. <laughs> like every single thing I said, you need an example to, you know, make that legit. And you're like, no, I need a statistic. Thank you very <laughs> much. Um, so, I, you know, I really what I'd like to do is dive into sort of the framework for this because I, I love the fact that it's research based. And I, I think you also shed light on some things that people, uh, might have some misperceptions about. So is there a way we could sort of look at the framework at a higher level and then go into sort of the impact-based actions to do yeah. something more concrete? Absolutely. Where do you want to start? Let's start at the very beginning. Um, you know, I, I think just the whole idea of creative destruction, I mean, just the entire framework from the book, like if you could outline those six chapters in five minutes, <laughs> if that's possible. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Just jump in wherever you want, uh, you want to interrupt because I I'm Absolutely. always wary, like podcast style of being a talking head, right? No, so feel feel free to talk for as long as you want. The fun of this is like that we get to have back and forth. Yeah, and uh, like I guess where I would start is to say, look, I I walked in thinking that to be an original person in the world, a nonconformist who drives creativity and change, that you had to be four things. I thought you had to be a risk taker, you had to be full of confidence, you had to have great ideas, and you had to be the first mover. And I discovered that all those things were wrong. Not only wrong, but backward. It turns out that most of the original people in the world, whether you're looking at Nobel Prize winning scientists, successful entrepreneurs, creative musicians and artists, have these opposite traits in common, where they're pretty risk averse. They're not daredevils. They're cautious. They feel the same doubt and fear that the rest of us do. They just harness it as as motivation as opposed to being paralyzed by it. They have bad ideas. In fact, they have more bad ideas than the rest of us. And that's how they, they get to some true originality is they generate enough volume to get variety and stumble on something new. And they're not first movers. They're procrastinators. They start things early, but they are deliberately slow to finish because they know that good ideas often take time to develop. And those discoveries really turned upside down my understanding of what it took to be original. And it made me realize that original people are not as different from the rest of us as, as I thought. And I was writing off a lot of people as, as not likely to be creative. And I was also writing myself off. And you know, so the book is, in many ways, it's about the, the sequel to creativity. Uh, so you know, lots of people have original ideas. And where the big gaps exist is they just don't generate enough variations on them to make them you know, promising. They don't know how to judge whether an idea is any good. And then you know, they need insight on how to speak up effectively and get heard and gain allies. And so, you know, I guess that's what the book is about. And then later I took the framework into, you know, some 
broader questions that you're already familiar with. But that, that, that would be my quick summary in a nutshell. Okay, cool. Well, let's get into each one of them. Uh, you know, I underlined this line from the book, which said, you know, when we become curious about the dissatisfying defaults in our world, we begin to recognize most of them have social origins, rules and systems were created by people. And that awareness gives us the courage to contemplate how we can change them. And, you know, it, it's interesting because you said that we have all these perceptions of people who are original, like risk takers, confidence, first movers. Um, and this is a question I've asked people in some form or another. Uh, if you've ever seen an interview with Chris Saka, he talks about this concept called the inevitability of success. And what he says about every person that he's invested in that has been a big success is that they believe that their success is inevitable. And I, I'm just really curious, you know, when you look at what you've said about, you know, harnessing the courage to speak up and to be original, do you think everybody has this inside of them? I think everyone has inside of them the potential to do something original. I think, you know, often the hard part is, you know, developing the knowledge and skills and, and, the you know the the right kind of of confidence to give it a shot, and you know I I guess you know my, the data that I have don't track perfectly with Chris's experience, um, in the sense that I I think that more often the the people who go on to do original things in the world uh, have come to convince themselves of the inevitability of effort mm-hmm. that they say look I don't I don't know I feel like you know I have the capability to do something important. I don't know whether I'm going to succeed or not, but I cannot live with myself as somebody who didn't try. Mm-hmm. And that's the way they overcome the paralyzing fear that freezes a lot of us is they say, yeah, I'm afraid of failing, but I'm even more afraid of failing to try, of failing to matter. Right? I could fail by starting a business that goes bankrupt, but I could also fail by never starting a business at all. Mm-hmm. And if I'm going to fail, I would rather be in the former camp than the latter. And, you know, I think that, that that leap is one that a lot of people have trouble making. And it's, I think it's why so many of the, you know, the blue chip entrepreneurs that, that Chris has worked with um, have had that inevitability of success is those are the people who, you know, who didn't hesitate. But, you know, I was struck. Elon Musk told me that he was convinced that Tesla was not going to succeed. Wow. And he was sure that the first few SpaceX launches would never get off the ground. And so I asked him, how did, how did you find the motivation and the, the courage to do it anyway? And he said it was too important not to try. Mm. There was no inevitability of success there. In fact, in his mind, it was much more near inevitability of failure. Wow. But he just felt like the mission mattered so much. And you know, he has this, this tremendous desire to you know, create a sustainable future for humanity. And you know, spaceflight is a big part of that. And he said, I can't live with myself if I don't give this a shot. Wow. I, I think you have finally given me a satisfactory answer to that question. Uh, I have asked so many people that question, and I've never been able to get an answer that truly satisfied me. But that may be the most interesting perspective I've heard on it yet. Oh, that's cool. Well, I, you know, I, I credit it to Elon and to a lot of the other you know, originals who I interviewed and who I read about. But mm-hmm. um, you know, I, I ran into Chris at TED, and we did not, we did not end up talking about this, this particular debate. <laughs> But uh, it, make, it makes me wonder how he would respond to it because my, you know, my instinct is he would say, yeah, but you know, Elon Musk still believed that he was going to succeed. He just didn't know if he was going to succeed in this particular startup uh-huh. right? or if he was going to succeed in space. And you know, I, I guess I, I, the, other, the other thing, what I would say as we have this fake conversation back and forth, <laughs> <laughs> here's how I would attempt to win this debate. Yeah. Uh, I, I would just add that I think people have the relationship between confidence and success backward. They think you have to be one of these brash people full of conviction in order to achieve success. Uh-huh. But confidence is actually won through success, right? So when you go and help to start PayPal and realize that a lot of the entrepreneurs who are doing crazy things in Silicon Valley are not different from you, they're not smarter than you, they just tried where you sat still, um, and then you do try and you succeed. You're like, hey, maybe I can do this after all. And your confidence grows in proportion to the things that you've accomplished. And I think too many people are waiting around for that magic moment when you know all of a sudden they feel like, I can do this. I have this amazing potential. And what they should do is charge forward anyway with, with plenty of doubt and then know that if they achieve some success, that's where their confidence is going to build. Hmm. So we you know we've talked extensively about the confidence piece what are the misperceptions that uh we have about risk and success and and you know what did your research reveal 
uh, to, to, you know, that proved to be the opposite of what we think. Well, my favorite study on this looked at entrepreneurs who have a choice. When they have an idea for an, a, biz, a business, they can either quit their jobs, which is what the risk-seeking entrepreneurs do, or they can say, no, play it safe, hang on to my day-to-day work and my salary, and start this business as a hobby on the side. That second group, it turns out, is 33% less likely to fail hmm. than the first group. If you look at a nationally representative study of thousands of American entrepreneurs. And you know, I think what happens there is there are lots of entrepreneurs who are swashbuckling pirates, but those are the ones who screw up a lot. And the people who, who say, you know, I'm going to walk to the edge of the cliff and I'm going to triple check my parachute and then have a safety net at the bottom. Those are, those are the ones who make smarter choices. Uh, they also, instead of feeling rushed because they've made a full-time leap you know, to get a product to market immediately and start bringing in some revenue, they feel like they've bought themselves the time and the freedom to really do it right. So I know that um, you, know, you, you opened the, the book with this chapter about blind-eyed inventors, or blind investors and one-eyed investors. And I had to have you talk about the Warby Parker story because I, I felt like there was such an important lesson there in terms of recognizing creative ideas. And uh, I, I'm just curious, you know, what are the lessons you took from that and what are the lessons we can take from that whole story? Well, I'm grateful to you for reminding me of one of my <laughs> many failures. <laughs> Uh, yeah, so Neil Blumenthal came to me uh, when it was actually my first class at Wharton. And he said, you know, I'm thinking about starting this company to sell glasses online with, with three friends. And I, I just thought it was insane that who would ever buy glasses online? You know, you have to go into the store and try them on. Now, I was the wrong person to be evaluating that because I don't wear glasses. <laughs> so I'm not exactly a credible candidate here. But one of the things that they did really cleverly was they said they changed their pitch over time and they had so many people tell them, look, you know, if this was a good idea, someone would have already done it, that they had to show them how many domains, you know, were really slow for that to happen. So they went and said, we're going to do for glasses what Zappos did for shoes. Mm. And all of a sudden people are like, oh yeah, I didn't used to order shoes online, but now I do that. And I don't even think twice about it. Maybe the same thing could happen for glasses. And then uh, GQ called them the Netflix for eyewear. And people are like, I used to go to Blockbuster and rent a movie, but I don't do that anymore. And you know, I really overlooked the, the power of taking an original idea that was unfamiliar and making it familiar by connecting it to a concept that people already understood. Um, one of the big mistakes that I made was I thought it made them sound derivative you know, like all these pitches that you hear today that are, right. the, well, I'm trying to do Uber for X. And I didn't realize that that was just a way of taking their original idea and, you know, making it something that other people could understand and wrap their minds about, around. Uh, where, where do human beings, like you know, people listening to this, tend to go wrong in their own perceptions of things like this? Um, you know, I think a lot of people go wrong in that they think, uh, there, there are a couple of places people go wrong, actually, but the... The biggest one for me is that they compare existing ideas to prototypes of what, what have been successful in the past. Mm. So you look at Warby Parker and you compare them to you know, other people who are trying to sell stuff online or you compare the, them to other eyewear companies. And those prototypes are not relevant because one, they succeeded in a different market. And two, you're trying to disrupt the very model of what, you know, what allows this product to take off. And I think trying to use the past to analyze future success in a turbulent industry is just a generally bad idea. You should analyze the past to see what lessons you can learn from it, but don't assume they're immediately relevant to the environment you're in now. Hmm. Well, let's talk about the first mover uh, advantage myth and you know dispel that one because I, I think there was so much interesting research that you came up with on that as well. And, and I'd love to talk a little bit about that. And then we'll start looking at some of those actions for impact that you talk about at the end of the book. Yeah, I, I always, I mean, this was another Warby Parker thing, right? They, they, uh, night, the day before the company launched, actually the night before the company launched, they still did not have, have a functioning website. Wow. You're, it's like, you guys, you realize this whole business is just a website. Right? That's literally all it is. And I thought they were toast because they had spent six months dragging their heels just trying to name the company right and you know build the brand in a way that was creative and Meanwhile, you know, you have all these competitors. They missed their first mover advantage. They're screwed. 
And then you look at all the research and you see that most of the time, first movers have a disadvantage, not an advantage. And you can see this in almost every domain. Um, if you look at 50 different product categories, over 500 companies, um, if you look at the automotive industry, uh, the, the list goes on and on. And what's striking is that people think that to be original, you have to be first. You don't. You just have to be different and better. And it's much easier to improve on someone else's idea than it is to, you know, to create a market from scratch. So you're the first mover. You have to get people used to this whole idea of doing something completely new. Um, and then you know, somebody else can swoop in and say, hey, you just created a market for me. I can dramatically improve on your technology or make your product far more user-friendly. And you know, I think it's one of the reasons that you know, Facebook succeeded where Friendster and MySpace failed. Um, it's one of the ways that you know, Google was able to enter after you know, Alta Vista and Ask Jeeves and Yahoo have gotten, gotten us used to searching. Uh, and that's, you know, I, th- I think if people realize, I'm not saying you know, wait to be the last mover. That's not smart either. But don't rush to go first. That's not what it, what it takes to be a, a successful entrepreneur, I guess, would be the message. Awesome. Well, let's do this. Uh, let's look at the, the 15 actions for impact that you talk about at the end of the book so people can start thinking about how they might specifically apply this in their own work. And you know, what I'd like to look at it is two, through two lenses, ideally. One, if you're not you know, somebody who's an entrepreneur and just doing creative work, for example, if you're an artist, how this applies. And then, of course, you know, if you're working in an organization, how you can apply these concepts. Yeah, I think the, I mean, the, the first and most important application here is I think that when, when I work with entrepreneurs, leaders, students, they just do not have enough ideas. Um, what I really want to see them do is, is triple their output. And they'll say, but like, I've run out of steam or I already love my third idea. And I will come back and say, I have yet to meet a, an original person who only had three ideas. Right. And I think that, you know, a lot of people feel like, you know, after I've generated a few ideas, I just run out of possibilities. And I would say that's the moment when you are ready to be original because you've freed yourself of the, the most conventional ideas that came to mind first. Um, so, you know, literally when you're trying to solve a problem or come up with a, a creative insight, whatever your normal target would be, I would say triple it and know that it's going to be harder. And you may have to, to procrastinate for a few days or at least a few hours and work on something that's a little bit mindless to let some unconscious processing happening. But that's where you will often improve your ability to do something truly new. Hmm. Where do you want to go next? Um, I know there were 15 of them in the book, like at the very <laughs> back of it. So you tell me. Yeah. A- anywhere you want to go. Um, well, the ideas one is interesting to me because, you know, I read a thousand words every morning and I, w- I was just thinking about uh, 2013, which was the most prolific year I ever had. And I realized I an- attributed entirely to output, nothing else, not quality by any stretch of the imagination. In fact, 90 percent of what I write is unusable. But <laughs> in that period, I, I self-published two books, produced a conference. We re- you know, produced more than 100 episodes of a podcast. And that's the tip of the iceberg. Yeah, you know, it, it just as a, a quick riff on that, um, Kurt Vonnegut had this great distinction between bashers and swoopers. Mm-hmm. Uh, bashers being the people who like write perfect sentences one at a time, and they don't move on until they've they've nailed each one. And swoopers, which it sounds like you're much more of, I am too. They just they just turn out a bunch of thoughts, and then they go back and they treat editing and revising as a separate process from generating. Yeah, I, I would absolutely say that's exactly how my process works. <laughs> I love it. So I, I mean, I don't know. I don't think anyone should ever be a basher, uh-huh. and that's a strong statement. But if if you look at all the the evidence that's come out in the past few decades on what it takes to be original, it consistently says that quantity is the best path to quality. And as a basher, yes, you will churn out maybe a few things that are perfectly done, uh, but I think their odds of being novel are lower, and you just generate a lot less output. As a swooper, you can get a lot more done and be every bit as original. So why not go that route? Um, other stuff. So uh, you know, another thing that I, I think is is important from a practical perspective is I, I work with so many entrepreneurs and creative people who only talk about the positives of their ideas. And I loved this example of Rufus Griscom, who pitched his startup by telling investors, "Here are the three reasons you should not back my company." and ended up being wildly successful with that approach. I think that we were trained to do this in debate class, right? Address counter arguments. 
But we forget to do it when it comes to pitching new ideas because we just get so excited about them or we're worried that other people are going to see the holes and we don't want to make that any easier. But if you're pitching it to anyone who you know, is interested and knowledgeable, they're going to see all the flaws that you do. And you can show that you're balanced and honest and self-critical by saying, look, I have this idea. Here's why I think it's promising. I do have you know, two or three big concerns about it, and I would love to chat about how you would go about addressing them. And then if you ask for the advice of your audience, um, you can actually engage them in a joint problem-solving dialogue, which is a much better way to present your ideas than this adversarial, no, all of your objections are wrong approach that a lot of entrepreneurs and creators get stuck in. Hey, it's Srini, and I just want to say thanks for listening. If you're finding our show inspiring or thought-provoking, the biggest thing that you can do to support us is to share the show with someone else who you think would find these conversations valuable. And with most podcast apps, you can just send a link via text. Thanks again for listening to the show. Hmm. You know, it's interesting. I am just finished uh, reading Chris Hadfield's book, uh, An Astronaut's Guide to Life on Earth. And it, it just may, reminds me of that because in their case, the, the consequences of, you know, this adversarial approach are literally death and billions of dollars. So they have to look at every potential worst case scenario. And, and I realized it was so weird. It was almost like 15 years later, my game theory class from college suddenly came full circle. I was like, oh, my God, that's what we do every time we try to cre- create a project. We're like, OK, what could go wrong here? And that's an important question to ask. Yeah, I think that's, I mean, we've learned so much from high reliability organizations on this. Um, you know, if you, look at, if you look at space flight organizations, if you look at nuclear power plants, hospitals, airlines, anybody who has to maintain consistent performance where the costs of errors are, are devastating, um, what you see is there's a tremendous preoccupation with failure. And you want an environment where it's unsafe not to speak up. Mm-hmm. about problems and, and issues and flaws that you see. And I think that it would be really great if more organizations work that way. Mm. So one other question I have around this is in terms of communicating your ideas uh, when they're original and nonconformist ideas to another group of people. Like how do you enroll people uh, in what you believe? So I think one, I mean, one of the, the things that you do is you try to get more exposure to your idea. Um, most of the time, the evidence suggests that it takes 10 to 20 exposures to an idea before people are really comfortable with it. And the more original it is, you know, the more they need to sort of get their minds around it. Um, so the, the advice is when your boss goes and, you know, and shoots down your idea, you should just come back six minutes later and be like, here it is again. No, <laughs> of course not. What you do is you say, you know, you know that idea that you shot down on Tuesday? I've been thinking a lot about your feedback. You gave me some great advice. Um, today is, you know, is Friday. Here's here's a different way of thinking about it. What's your take on this? Um, I think you know another thing that you do though is sometimes you have to hide what you're really after. Um, this is uh, this is a great uh, this is another Elon Musk example, but uh, he's been thinking about Mars for a while. But when he recruited engineers to join him at SpaceX, he didn't mention Mars because people thought it was crazy. What's this guy from payments going to be able to do to get us <laughs> into space, let alone you know, colonize another planet, right? So um, he became uh, what, what researchers call a tempered radical, which is somebody who has an extreme idea but you know, sort of couches it in more moderate language. And he says, look, what I want to do is you know, get a private commercial vehicle into space, um, into orbit, and then you know, eventually let's get it back. And once they prove they can do that, now Mars does not sound so far-fetched. And I think that kind of tempered radicalism is what a lot of originals have to master because if you have a wildly creative idea, you know, the more transparent you are about what your mission and your ultimate vision is, the more people are just going to think that you're ridiculous. And you know, if you can have some more moderate milestones along the way and, and start by explaining those, then as you build up some progress, you can start to unveil what's really in the Trojan horse. So I have a couple of final questions for you. Um, knowing what we do about all of this, and especially given the perspective that you have on, on you know, being a psychologist and research and understanding human motivation, um, why do you think that if we have the capacity inside all of us to do original work and to do these kinds of things, we see such a wide spectrum of achievement when it comes to human performance, which I realize I- we could probably do an entire book just on that. There, there is a book waiting to be written on that. <laughs> I, I, I know you have nothing better to do, Srinivas. You well, should go this, do it. This has actually been the question I think that has been driving a significant amount of my work for the last six years. 
And I mean, this is so cool. What's so cool about the podcast, right, is you bring in all these people who, you know, are not, there's not a gap between their potential and what they've achieved. Exactly. And some of them even believe that they've overachieved relative to their potential. <laughs> uh, I, you know, I think, I think a lot of it comes down to a combination of fear and futility. Um, you know, the fear part we talked about, right, being yeah. worried that you're going to look stupid or foolish or embarrass yourself in some way and, and not realizing that in the long run, the re- regrets you have are the chances not taken, um, that those are the things you wish you could do over the most. And then futility being, you know, I just, I don't believe that anybody's really going to take this seriously or hear me. Um, you know, Elizabeth Gilbert had a great observation about this. She said, um, you know, all these people are going around and saying, I'm not creative. She said, that's a, 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 that's just a, it's a bad sentence and it's an irrational thought because every person is unique in one way or another. And imagine just substituting, I'm not creative with, I'm not curious. You would laugh at that statement. She said, you know, and I think that's so powerful to say, look, if you realize that we're all curious and even if you feel like you're not curious, you could wake up tomorrow morning and ask some questions that you've never asked before or wonder about something that's always intrigued you, but you've never pursued. And once you realize that curiosity is the starting point to being creative and doing something original, then you realize that we could, we could all do a little bit more of that. Well, uh, this has been awesome, as I, as I expected it would be. So I have one last question for you, which is how we finish all our interviews at the Unmistakable Creative. What do you think it is that makes somebody or something unmistakable? Unmistakable is such a hard thing to define. Um, you know, I mean, the, the irony is, like, when you talk about being unmistakably creative, when we de- define creativity, we talk about it, you know, as, as being novel and appropriate, if it's art. Or novel and useful, if it's you know something in the world of, of business or technology. And how do you know whether something is novel or useful? The, the world's leading expert on this topic, Teresa Mavale, says you ask a bunch of people in that domain, and then if there's consensus among them that it's novel and useful, then you know if it's deemed creative, it is creative. And the more people deem it creative, and the more confident they are that it's creative, the more unmistakably creative it is. And the irony of that is the more original you are the harder it is for experts to agree, right? And achieve that consensus. <laughs> so I think there's a paradox. I think that, you know, unmistakable on its face is consensus. But the more radically original something is, usually the slower you know, we are to get to consensus. So I have no idea how to define it. And I think that's part of the beauty of your podcast <laughs> is, you know, we, we all have our own ideas about what makes something unmistakable and unmistakably creative. And the less they overlap with other people's, maybe the better. Wow. Uh, well, this has been phenomenal, as, as I expected it would be. And uh, I, I really appreciate you taking the time to join us and share your insights and your story, especially as somebody who's been a big fan of your work and all of your books. Uh, this has just been phenomenal. I'm honored that it, it struck a chord. Uh, I'm a big fan of the podcast and uh, and your writing as well. And it's really cool to see a whole community of people come around or, or come together around this topic that uh, I think is so important and probably not discussed or analyzed enough. Well, I, I think that makes a, a beautiful way to wrap up our conversation. And for everybody listening, we will wrap the show with that.